I'm a rational, common sense kind of, kind of person. I don't have horns. I don't have a tail. We all, I assume, want the same things, and that is for people to realize their God-given potential. We may have different uh, routes of doing that, different policies for, for doing that, but we all want the same thing. And the way that I'm treated by the left-wing media sometimes is almost amusing to me. And this is why so many people uh, have this have this reaction to me until I open my mouth and they realize uh, that, I, that I'm not some sort of, um, of a radical person that's gonna undermine their rights, uh, that's gonna club baby seals uh, and eat their heads. Uh, I'm a commonsensical kind of guy who's got commonsensical, commonsensical points of view, born and raised in this state, and I wanna see people realize their potential. Welcome, Mr. Elder. I'm David Lesher. I'm the editor here at Cal Matters, and, mm -hmm. and I'm going to play a, kind of a host for our discussion today. Um, we also have a panel of reporters and editors who uh, we'd like to talk about all the major issues facing California today. So, um, and also, as you know, I, I hope we're recording this conversation and it will be shared in our online voter guide in, in whole um, for um, for the recall election, our, our voter guide uh, at calmatters.org. Um, so let me make a quick round of introductions and then we'll get right to questions so we can cover as much ground as I, as we can, like I said. Um, just uh, uh, for our, our folks, if you wanna wave when I, when I say your name, Vicki Haddock is our managing editor. Uh, Foon Ri is our political editor. Ben Christopher is our political reporter. Emily Hoven is our newsletter writer. Rachel Becker is our environment reporter. Ana Ibarra is our health reporter. Joe Hong is our education reporter. Veranda Lyons is our justice reporter. And Manuela Tobias is our housing reporter. So you see we got a lot of topics to cover. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over uh, right away to Emily Hoven, our newsletter writer, to get us started. And I will come back in and, and moderate between and move things along so we can get to everybody before we're done. So thanks and take it away, Emily. Thanks, Dave, and nice to meet you, Mr. Elder. Thanks for taking the time. Um, to hop right in, um, one of the things that Governor Newsom has frequently touted in his appearances across the state and in the recall uh, anti-recall campaign is the state's $80 billion surplus. Um, and I'm wondering if you could name some specific ways in which you would spend that money and how those ways might differ from the priorities that um, the governor has, has identified. First of all, I question whether it's $80 billion. I've heard it's half that. Uh, and even outgoing uh, Governor uh, Jerry uh, Brown criticized the amount of spending uh, that uh, Gavin Newsom has been doing and said that that surplus is gonna be turned to a deficit within the next year or two because of the uh, obligations that uh, this governor and the legislature uh, have made. Uh, but regarding what I would do with the money, I would pay some, some of the uh, unfunded pension liability down. Uh, also, I would use some of the money for uh, fire uh, suppression. Uh, we have not uh, cleared away the fallen trees and the dry vegetation. Uh, I think LA Times said that the governor uh, fibbed, uh, exaggerated by, pack, by a factor of seven uh, on the acres that he's cleared away. He claimed he cleared away 90,000, which frankly is a drop in the bucket, but it turned out he only he cleared about 13% uh, of what he said. So I would use some of the money for that. Interesting. And so this sort of feeds into that a little bit. What are the top three biggest pr problems you see facing the state that you would take action on ASAP the second you get in there? How would you prioritize that? One of them, to the extent that we still have mandates on uh, face masks and mandates on vaccinations, I would remove those right away. Uh, we have a real problem with homelessness. Uh, I would declare a state of emergency on homelessness to suspend some of the environmental rules and regulations, most notably CEQA, suspend it or waive it so that uh, some of the uh, over hundred, hundreds of thousands of units that are all ready to go, but for the lawsuits could be, could be gone. I would declare a state of emergency on water. We have a huge water shortage uh, in this state. I was in Kern County recently and they talked about all of the water being drained out into the Pacific Ocean. We do have rainy seasons. We're not storing enough of it. Uh, and we've not building enough projects uh, to build more dams, more reservoirs to uh, store the water that we do have. Uh, voters have voted consistently for bond measures for various projects, 
And those projects are held up for all sorts of reasons, not least of which are the lawsuits, <clears throat> excuse me, filed by the environmental extremists that don't seem to understand the trade-offs between things like the Delta smelt uh, and human beings. So I'm hearing a lot of emergency powers, emergency de declarations. Um, how would you plan to work in conjunction with the legislature, a supermajority of which is democratic, or would you plan to lean primarily on the powers of your office? Well, I think I can do both. Um, one of the things that uh, former Governor Pete Wilson told me when I recently consulted with him is that, <clears throat> excuse me, not, not a um, single vetoed bill has been overwritten in almost 40 years in California. That was surprising to me because one of the reasons I initially uh, did not want to run is because uh, of the supermajority uh, Democrat legislature we have in Sacramento and my assumption that whenever I vetoed something, it would be, read would be readily overridden. Uh, much to my surprise, a bill has not been overridden since I think the early 1980s. Uh, and uh, it's largely because once a bill that's that bad has been passed and vetoed, the governor, governor makes the case to the California people as to why the bill was bad. Uh, and lo and behold, the legislature does not override it. The other thing he told me is that uh, you'd be also surprised at the extent to which if you advise the Democrats that you intend to empower Republicans, that is, that you want them to break into consideration Republicans, Republican input for bills, the bills become a lot more sensible. I also, of course, have a line item veto. I do have the ability to declare a, a public emergency. Uh, and in many states, commissioners don't have a whole lot of power, but in California, as you well know, they have a great deal of power, particularly the Coastal Commission, the Public Utilities Commission. And I'm going to appoint people and give them marching orders uh, to make things far more sensible, to uh, restrict some of the burdens that uh, make life uh, unlivable for California. As you know, we're, for the first time in our state's history, we're having a net migration of people out of California. And it's not just millionaires and billionaires who are leaving, it's middle-class people making between 50 and 100K. And the number one reason they cite for leaving uh, is the price of houses. So uh, I have a lot more power than I thought I did, uh, even dealing with the hostile legislature. And um, last question for me before I turn it back to Dave. Um, obviously you haven't been at any of the debates that they've had so far and you have sort of expressed- They've only, they've only, they've only had two. You make it sound like a lot of them, they only had two. Well, there's another one on Thursday, I believe. Um, and I don't I'll, I'll, I'll skip that one too, though. <laughs> yeah, so can you talk a little bit more about your rationale? I mean, obviously, it's a great way to reach voters, share your platform, share who you are with people who may not know you. So what's your um, strategy in not attending those debates? And what would it take for you to attend one? Well, uh, the only person I want to debate is Gavin Newsom. Uh, that's the person I'm running against. I'm not running against the Republican rivals. I'm running against Gavin Newsom. This is a recall election. And I do think I'm reaching a lot of uh, voters by talking to people like you, talking to the Sacramento Bee editorial board and a bunch of other editorial boards as I did uh, for over an hour in one conversation. Uh, and I also spoke to a very hostile Los Angeles Times editorial board as well. I'm also doing a lot of rallies going up and down the state, talking to a lot of people. And I'm talking to print media, to uh, TV media and to radio media. Uh, I have a substantial lead over my Republican rivals. That's one of the reasons why they want to debate me. Uh, if I was sitting at 2% of the polls, I'd want to debate me as well. But again, uh, we all pretty much agree on what the issues are. The issues are the rising cost of living. The issues are the rising homelessness. The issues are the uh, rise in crime uh, and the way this governor shut down the state, ignoring science quite frequently, while having his own children enjoy in-person private education, while denying the opportunity for in-person education for the uh, uh, people that attend uh, government schools. 80% of the kids attending government schools are black and brown. These are the ones that they claim that they care about. So I think pretty much all of us know what the issues are and pretty much all of us have uh, pretty commonsensical sol solutions for these issues. So I don't see a whole lot of point in debating my Republican rivals when if, let, if the first part of the ballot does not go our way, that is 50% of voters plus one must agree to recall Gavin Newsom. It really doesn't matter what the rest of the Republicans say or do. Uh, and frankly, I would support any of my Republican rivals, the, the, the prominent ones anyway, over Gavin Newsom. Good. Thank you, Emily. Um, and, and now I want to turn to the environment and uh, our uh, environment reporter, Rachel Becker. Hi. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Um, you know, we know that environmental issues are really at the top of people's minds right now. So I'm looking forward to, to hearing your thoughts, starting with how you envision executive orders as part of your environmental arsenal. You know, we know that 
Governor Newsom has issued a number of environmental executive orders, including phasing out the sale of new gas powered cars in the state over the next 15 years, you know, a mandate to stop approving new oil fracking. So what happens to those orders if you take office? Uh, well, uh, they'll, they'll be repealed. Uh, I believe that we've had a war on um, oil and gas in California for decades. California at one time was headquartered to all 10 of the major oil and gas companies. I think the only one left now is Chevron and they're putting many of their uh, assets uh, in places like Texas. Uh, I also uh, believe that we ought to be encouraging fracking, not discouraging fracking, it can be done safely. I also think there's a problem with the perception of nuclear. Uh, we only have one nuclear power plant left now, that's Diablo. San Onofre was shut down a little while ago and Diablo is, is expected to be decommissioned in the next few years. It is one of the reasons why we're having a rolling brownouts. I think roughly around eight to 10% of our energy uh, was coming from nuclear. Less and less is now coming from nuclear. Uh, and the, the perception of nuclear is that it's about uh, Chernobyl or Three Mile Island. Uh, Chernobyl was always poor technology. Three Mile Island, uh, by the way, nobody died in Three Mile Island, but the technology is far better than it was even back then. Uh, and nuclear is uh, carbon emissions free. So, what would you me, so it seems to me that some of the environmentalists ought to be taking a look at, uh, at nuclear. Uh, and also this business about force feeding our economy from a fuel fossil based economy to a renewable based economy also omits uh, costs and benefits. There's a documentary that the, the producer of Michael Moore's film did called Planet of the Humans where they argued that it is false uh, that we can uh, on a dime have a re renewable based economy and the documentary even chastised people like Al Gore for giving that false impression. So for all those reasons, I think we're having rolling brownouts. We're having energy shortages that we ought not have here in California. And I'm going to use whatever powers I can uh, to reverse that uh, so that we have abundance. We don't have rolling brownouts and shortages though, as we're having right now. I certainly would not uh, mandate any kind of uh, electric cars by X year, whatever he's done. I think uh, he said we should have a carbon neutral economy by 2035 or something like that. No matter what California does, as long as China and India are still spewing out CO2, whatever we do will have absolutely no effect or a negligible effect on the economy, uh, on the on the climate rather, while doing a great deal of damage to our economy, particularly oh. middle class middle class people and lower class people whose energy bills are going to be higher because of this. I'm curious. So the California's climate regulators have said, though, that there are much bigger cuts in climate warming pollution needed to reach the statutory goal of reducing greenhouse gases by 40% over the next 10 years. Um, so I'd love to talk a little bit more about how you plan to address that. It sounds like nuclear is going to be a big part. Um, and so also how specifically you intend to, to promote nuclear in California. Uh, well, regarding the statutory goals, are, are they statutory goals or are they executive goals that have been pushed by uh, by this governor? Their law. Uh, we we have uh, their state law. We have a greater percentage of energy required to become from coming from renewables every single year, which has deprived people like PG and E from uh, spending money on fire safety and fire prevention that they otherwise would. Uh, I would argue that these laws are bad, and to the extent that I can make the case to, for, for California voters to repeal them or roll them back, I will. So we're seeing, you know, the, the consequences of, of climate change, worsening wildfires, dangerous heat waves, um, increased risk of extreme drought. How much of a threat do you think climate change poses to California and what are you prepared to do to address it? The assumption seems to be that the reason for the severity of fires is because of climate change. I certainly think climate change has, it has a role, plays a factor. And I think human activity plays a role, a factor in climate change. But I think the bigger problem uh, has been the war on logging. The logging industry is a shell of what it used to be. And as a result, we have thicker trees than we used to have before. Uh, and, as, 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 and as I said, he um, misled Californians by a factor of around seven about how many, many acres of fallen trees and dead vegetation that he's cleared away. Uh, I'm gonna clear that away. Governor Jerry Brown left a plan to clear 500,000 acres of fallen trees and uh, dry vegetation, uh, which is a massive, massive amount. Uh, and uh, he claimed, Gavin Newsom did, that he cleared 90,000 uh, 90, acres away when he cleared about uh, one seventh of that away. Uh, so I would say the, the bigger factor driving the severities of these, of these fires and why we're so concerned about them uh, is a growing number of, of homes and, uh, and uh, structures that are there. 
uh, as opposed to as opposed to the climate. Again, I'm not saying climate doesn't have a factor, but uh, I don't believe that it's nearly as big a factor uh, as the human failure to en enact the, the type of fire suppression measures that should have been enacted a long time ago. You mentioned that you'd spend some of the state's surplus on, on forest management, but the biggest landlord in California is the federal government, um, which owns more than half of uh, the forest in California. So how, how would you tackle that? Well, it's all about relationships. It's all about having a, uh, a, a um, relationship with the feds, with the various uh, players, including state players. Uh, and I would get them together and get us all on one same page. Um, it's, it's everybody's best interest to clear a fall on trees and dry vegetation. Uh, it's not done on the federal land to the extent that it should have been that should be done. It's not done on state land to the extent that it should be done. This is all about relationships. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, so I want to move to our next topic is health care um, and our health reporter, Ana Ibarra. Thanks for doing this, Mr. Elder. So I'll start with the question about uh, COVID vaccines. Uh, we know that vaccines are the best tool we have to protect ourselves and others against the virus. You've shared that you're vaccinated, but you are opposed to vaccine mandates. So I'm wondering if not by mandates, what do you think should be done that hasn't been done yet to increase vaccination in the state, especially among people maybe who still face access uh, issues or you know uh, have the barrier of maybe taking time off work? Well, it seems to me virtually everybody in California who wants to be vaccinated uh, can be vaccinated. Poor people can get vaccinated for free. Uh, and, the, and the increased uh, infections we, we are seeing are from people who are unvaccinated. It seems to me uh, that that news ought to motivate a lot of people to get vaccinated. Uh, as you pointed out, I've been vaccinated. I'm not at, at all opposed to, to vaccines. I believe vaccines work. But there are a lot of people who are concerned about how quickly the vaccine came online. Uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris both advised people that if Donald Trump told them to take the vaccine, they wouldn't take it. And now they're shocked that a lot of people are not taking the vaccine. Some people have already contracted the coronavirus and feel that they have uh, antibodies. And some people have a healthy skepticism of government and just don't want to do it. It seems to me that uh, that those people ought to assume the risk that they, that they could contract the vaccine and give it to other people who are unvaccinated. And the unvaccinated are going to assume the risk that other unvaccinated people could give them the vaccine. But that is what we that's the, that's the kind of risk that we assume uh, in a free country. Thomas Jefferson warned against trading uh, freedom for public safety, and I think he was right. So I, I understand the, the argument uh, with, with uh, personal freedom, uh, but like I said, there are still people who might be facing access issues. Uh, you know, I've written a lot about uh, some lower income neighborhoods facing issues with people not being afraid to take time off work if they're the head of household. So I'm wondering if you have any ideas of how we can truly make vaccines just as easy as possible for people. Well, you know, I watch uh, a lot of Spectrum One because my cable TV defaults to it. Uh, and I'm seeing all sorts of people going to people in, uh, in impoverished neighborhoods. There's all sorts of free programs for people who are, who are poor to get, uh, to get vaccinated. I'm not quite sure uh, that it's true that uh, people who are poor can't get vaccinated and people who are working can't take time off, especially when people are coming to them. So to the extent that we have programs like that, I would urge the, uh, those programs to continue. But I really believe that most people who have not gotten vaccinated have made the choice one way or the other, rightly or wrongly, not to be vaccinated. I'm not, I'm not arguing that we should hold them down and make them get vaccinated. I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's right. I don't think I have the authority to do that. And I think that's inconsistent with, with, the, with the basic freedoms that we love and enjoy here in America. So what happens if you become governor and then this fall or later on, we start to see cases and hospital admissions start to rise at concerning rates. Can you walk us through, like, what does that response look like? Well, let's remember the whole point behind the, the mandates was to make sure that we did not have a run on our healthcare system, that we did not run out of ventilators, we did not run out of, run out of ICU units. Uh, that is not happening. Uh, while hospitalizations hospitalizations are going up, uh, we're not nearly having the same kind of, uh, of pressure on our on our healthcare system that we had during the peak of the pandemic. Uh, that was the whole rationale. The other rationale was that we would buy time uh, for treatments to come online and for vaccination to come online. We have treatments now. We have vaccinations now. So uh, I don't agree that the uh, the increase in, in hospitalizations uh, is a reason why we ought to be. Uh, we ought to be forcing mandates on people. Also, uh, from what I can tell, while we do have infections going up, 
Uh, we're able to treat them far better than we could before. And so our deaths are not necessarily going up. Now, I know there's a lag time between infections and deaths, but we're still not seeing anything like we saw at the peak of the pandemic when the whole rationale before all of this was for us not to have uh, a rush on our healthcare system uh, to the point where, where it's breaking. It's not nearly to that point right now. So once again, I think that when you look at everything, uh, freedom, uh, the fact that most people, or virtually everybody who wants a vaccination can get a vaccination, uh, I think that uh, we have to leave it to the judgment of the American people and their common sense uh, to respond to people who, who encourage them to get vaccinated uh, and to look at the data that shows vaccinate, vaccines do in fact work. So before I run out of time, I do want to ask, uh, you know, besides the pandemic, healthcare access and affordability continue to be top concerns for many Californians. Um, this year, Governor Newsom expanded Medi-Cal access to more undocumented immigrants. He also has a committee of experts exploring how the state can get closer to universal coverage. Um, Democratic legislators have a single payer bill that will come up for consideration again next year. So I wanted to get your thoughts on these efforts and is coverage expansion and affordability something that is on your priority list? I don't believe that taxpayers should be spending money on uh, fighting health care for illegal aliens and not called undocumented, by the way, they're called illegal aliens. If you look at the U.S. code, there's no such term for undocumented. The term is illegal alien. Uh, and uh, regarding single payer, I'm absolutely opposed to that. The, the best way for us to increase access, to decrease the cost of health care and increase the quality is for competition. And we're having less of it, not more of it. Good. Thank you, Anna. Um, I, our next topic is uh, education, K-12 education, uh, and our education reporter is Joe Hong. Uh, <clears throat> Thanks for being here, Mr. Elder. Um, so you've expressed your support for, uh, for school vouchers. Why is this type of uh, systemic change the most effective way to close the achievement gap, especially along uh, racial and socioeconomic lines? Because as I was saying about healthcare, the most effective way of improving almost anything is through competition. Uh, I believe a government monopoly on education does not give us the kind of excellence that we're looking for. 75% of black boys cannot read at state levels of proficiency, that's before the pandemic. Almost half of third graders cannot read at state levels of proficiency. I went to Crenshaw High School and I just checked only 2% of kids at Crenshaw High School are math proficient. What I wanna do is give parents an opportunity to put their kid in a public school, a private school, a charter school, or a religious school. We have those kinds of options at the collegiate and at the uh, graduate level, but for some reason there's a uh, no-fly zone over competition for K through 12. I think that's wrong. I understand there's gonna be a bill coming online, or at least an initiative coming online that would have set up education savings accounts so the amount of money that we spend per capita K through 12 can be put into an account that the parents can control. I also want to point out that uh, when you look at um, the issue of choice, uh, the primary obstacle, of course, are teachers and teachers union. They adamantly oppose school choice uh, because the teachers would not automatically become union members and they would not get automatic dues. Meanwhile, if you look at studies about where uh, public school teachers send their own school age kids, uh, the likelihood is far greater that they're going to put their own kid in a private school than uh, a, a household that does not have a, a, a public school teacher in it. So it turns out, in my opinion, the people that know the school system the best, public school teachers, don't put their own school age kids in them. It seems to me that's a pretty damning thing about uh, the quality of our, of our public schools. They're near the bottom of all 50 states as it is. Uh, and I believe that competition will improve not only the, the outcome for the kids who go to private school, but it'll also improve the uh, quality of public education because they're going to want to compete for those kids. They're not going to want to lose those kids uh, to the other options I pointed out. Also, during this uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic, a lot of parents have been able to watch through virtual education uh, the quality of education their kids are getting. And that's one of the reasons why a growing number of parents want to homeschool their kids. I believe I just read an article, I think it was in the LA Daily News, that shows two thirds of black parents no longer want to send their kids back to Los Angeles Unified School District because they've seen the quality of education. Uh, they believe, and I believe they're correct, that the worst teachers, the worst principals, the worst bureaucrats end up in schools in South Central as opposed to the Valley or, or as opposed to the West Side. Uh, the number one funder of my opponent, Gavin Newsom, is a teacher's union, and they are, as I said, adamantly opposed to real school choice, including private school vouchers, which is why I question why black and brown parents, though the polls show the majority of them want school choice, routinely pull that lever for the Democratic Party year after year after year. What is the number one route towards escaping poverty to get to the middle class, to make sure you get a competent, 
uh, high school education. There's a think tank that's on the left called the Brookings Institution, and they have something called the Millennial Success Sequence on how to leave, uh, leave poverty and get to the middle class. And the first step is to finish high school, presumably one where you can read, write, and compute at grade level. And they, and they don't say that that, 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 sequence, that success sequence only applies to white kids. They, they say it applies to all of us. The way to escape poverty uh, is to get a competent education, first step, and all too often we're not getting that here. And in, in light of the, the spread of the Delta variant, um, what role do you think the governor's office or the state should play in ensuring safe school reopenings this fall? Uh, should masking and vaccines be required for all eligible students and staff? I, I again, would not mandate masks. I would not mandate vaccines. If parents want to um, advise their kids to wear a mask because they believe that, that, that they'll be more safe, they can certainly do that. Uh, I would not outlaw masks, obviously, but if parents want to want to uh, have their kids wear them, uh, that's their option. And teachers, if teachers are concerned about contracting the coronavirus, they of course can get vaccinated. Well, uh, I, I've talked to to parent groups though who a year ago were really pushing hard for reopening schools, and now this year they're really pushing hard for vaccine mandates for teachers because they think the state should be doing everything they it, it can to keep schools open for the entire school year. So what's your response to those parents? I've talked to parents that have just said just the opposite. Fair enough. Um, who would you put, who would you appoint to, to the State Board of Education? I haven't made that decision yet, but I'm gonna appoint somebody who truly believes in choice and education, somebody who has the same philosophy as the former Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. Uh, I like what she was doing. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna appoint somebody who's got that same kind of philosophy. Great, thank you. Great. Thank you, Joe. Um, our next topic is justice issues and our reporter on justice issues is Rhonda Lyons. Hi, Mr. Elder, thanks for joining. Um, uh, Governor Newsom signed an executive, order on the, uh, an executive order on the death penalty, um, an executive moratorium on the death penalty, even after voters overwhelmingly said that they support executions. If you were to be elected as governor, would you resume executions or would you also uh, place a moratorium on the practice? As you pointed out, uh, Californian voted to retain the death penalty. <clears throat> uh, this man came out and he ignored the will of the people in California. I won't do that. I will restore the death penalty. And um, I was looking at some interviews that you've done in the past where you've mentioned um, that you think drugs should be decriminalized. Do you still have that viewpoint? And if you're elected as governor, would you do anything to decriminalize drugs in California? Would that be um, something that you would focus on? Uh, it's, it's low priority for me, but yes, uh, I, I believe that we ought to deal with the drug problem uh, as a public health problem rather than a criminal justice problem. Uh, one of the problems I find with decriminalizing marijuana, the idea was to get rid of the black market, but because of all the taxes and all the regulations, from what I can tell, the black market is alive and well. And, and uh, that one of the ob objectives of having a decriminalization of, of marijuana has not been achieved. I would take a hard look at uh, the taxes and the regulations that drive up the price and that it's, that it's still caused the black market to, to thrive. Is there anything in specific that you would do um, besides taking a look? Like, would you work with the legislature? That might be something you and the you and the legislature could agree on. Would that be would that be a way to I, I think, work yes. with them? I think you'd be surprised at how many things that the legislature and I will be able to agree on, and that sounds like one of them. Um, you have a background in law, um, and so you know that the governor has a lot of power when it comes to appointing judicial officers. Who's on your short list for the state Supreme Court? And what are your priorities for judicial candidates? Uh, what, what would, how would, how would you, uh, what would you look at when you would appoint um, uh, ju justices and judges? Well, again, I haven't given this one a whole lot of thought as to specific names, but uh, my overall judicial philosophy uh, is that of an originalist. Uh, I, I, one of my favorite Supreme Court justices is Clarence Thomas. Uh, and I would uh, appoint people that are in the mold of somebody like Clarence Thomas, who believes that the laws, that the Constitution uh, means what it says and says what it means. I would not appoint people that, in my opinion, are judicial activists one way or the other. Are, have you worked with people who you think would be good justices or good judges that you want to mention? 
As I said, uh, they're going to be in the mold of people like Clarence Thomas. I'm sure there are a whole lot of people uh, in California who are quite qualified, who have that kind of judicial philosophy. Uh, and when I become governor, I will be looking at people that will have that kind of philosophy, who will be able to govern uh, in the minds of the way Antonin Scalia did and Clarence Thomas. Um, what is the biggest challenge, in your opinion, facing California's justice system? And how are you uniquely prepared to address it versus Governor Newsom or even your other candidates? I think the biggest challenge uh, in California in general is the intrusiveness of government. Uh, I believe that a government that governs less governs best. Uh, and uh, to the extent that there are all sorts of rules and regulations uh, that have been put uh, in the path of developers, uh, of people that uh, are, are, are business owners and job creators, uh, I would be looking to remove some of those impediments. What about from a criminal justice standpoint? Well, I believe that uh, criminals should, for, could, should face their full terms. I'm not in favor of cashless bail. If there's something I can do about that, I would and, and I will. Uh, I think we've got two soft on crime DAs in San Francisco and in Los Angeles, both of whom, by the way, are facing recall elections. And I would urge uh, the uh, California voters to recall them. Um, but I believe that, um, that uh, when you commit a crime, you should do the time. And the idea that we should be releasing prisoners early, it's offensive to me. Uh, during this coronavirus pandemic, 20,000 convicted felons have been released uh, under early release, presumably for compassionate reasons. Uh, I think it's one of the reasons why crime has gone up. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Baranda. Um, our next topic is an important one. It's housing. Uh, and our housing reporter is Manuela Tobias. Hi, Mr. Elder. Thanks for your time. Um, so you mentioned this before um, briefly, but could you um, explain what you would do differently than what Governor, Governor Gavin Newsom has done um, during the pandemic and is doing now to reduce homelessness? Well, I believe one of the reasons we have a homeless problem in, in California is because of laws like CEQA. A uh, sequel somehow has been waived or gotten around when the billionaire owner of the Sacramento Kings wanted to build a stadium. I don't see why we can't look at uh, ways we can soften the impact of sequel so that uh, contractors and developers can uh, can build far more housing. We have a housing shortage here in California. Some have put it as as, uh, as low as 800,000. Others have put it as high as 1.5 million units. As I've traveled around the country and talked to developers, they tell me that they, for example, had a project to build, say, 10,000 homes uh, 20 years ago. Uh, they cut it down to five, got sued, cut it down to 1,000, to a got sued, and ultimately uh, they were able to get uh, a project approved for 200 units. Uh, there's a reason why California prices have just now hit an average price of a home in California just hit $800,000. That's 150% more uh, than the average price of a home in America. One of the frequent uh, people that I had on my radio show when I had a radio show was Leo Hanian, the econ professor from UCLA. And he says, because of CEQA and other rules and regulations, the average price of a home in California is 150% is 50 more than it otherwise would be, but for these rules and regulations. Uh, to the extent that I have the power to do that, I'm going to be suspending or waiving or softening the impact of CEQA so the developers can make more housing come online. The reason we're having a net migration out of California for the first time in our state's history, and we're 170 years old, uh, is that uh, middle class people, people making between 50 and 100K, are leaving. And the number one reason they cite for leaving California is they cannot afford to get that first house. Uh, so it seems to me there are all sorts of rules and regulations that uh, are, are causing developers to have projects reduced or developers not to even consider projects for fear of all the litigation and how long it takes to build a home. And so um, Gavin Newsom has also addressed CEQA as being a, a big issue in, in housing development and has still not really been able to um, fully get across, get over that issue um, because it is a big tool used by powerful interest groups um, in the legislature. There's labor unions, there's affordable housing groups, there's homeowner groups, um, and this is a powerful tool for them too to ensure that new projects include affordable units or pay fair wages. Um, these groups are also huge power players in the legislature and have been very effective at killing housing legislation. Um, the inability to get these groups on the same page has blocked uh, multiple housing packages from getting through since 2017, even with a democratic supermajority. So what steps would you take to 
A, actually get rid of CEQA, and B, to build coalitions or actually reach uh, agreements with these groups that are key to passing housing legislation? Well, I, I, I take exception to your premise that uh, Gavin Newsom has, uh, has been uh, hostile to CEQA. It seems to me that Gavin Newsom uh, is a climate change alarmist, believes that um, our, our climate, uh, like AOC, is coming to a dramatic end unless uh, we do a whole bunch of things to force feed our economy from a fossil fuel-based economy uh, to a renewable-based economy. So I'm not sure at all he's uh, uh, nearly as uh, negative towards CEQA as you suggest in your question. But just to clarify um, what I was referring to, for example, SB7 that he signed into law um, a couple months ago that, for example, um, streamlines CEQA, doesn't allow that for, um, for certain um, bigger public works projects, for example, and there have been similar um, attempts for, for housing as well. So that's what I was um, making reference to. Well, but in any case, um, I would use whatever power that I can. I'd be consulting, obviously, with my legal counsel to find out to what degree I could suspend or waive or soften CEQA. Uh, it is a law that's been used, as developers tell me, to stop almost any project for any reason for an indefinite period of time. Uh, and I don't think that the governor has used his bully pulpit to explain to the, uh, to the taxpayers, to Californians, exactly the damage being done by these kinds of laws. Uh, these kinds of laws, as I said, have resulted in a dramatic shortage of, of houses in California, which is why the price of homes is so high. And I'm not sure that the average Californian understands the, uh, the power of these environmental extremists. Uh, and the stranglehold they have over lawmakers in, uh, in, in Sacramento. I'm going to use the power of my bully pulpit to explain these kinds of things. So hopefully we'll get pressure on lawmakers to soften, uh, to waive, or to water down sequels so that we can unleash the power of the public sector, private sector, so they can build enough homes so that Californians don't have to leave. So as I mentioned, environmentalists aren't the only ones that are using this tool. Um, there's also labor unions, there's um, affordable housing groups, there's community groups. Who, who use this as well, and they're key to getting any type of housing legislation passed. How would you um, work with them to, to get something through the legislature, or is all of this sort of using more the executive power? Well, it's both. Uh, it's also, again, using the power of, the, uh, of my bully pulpit to talk about this. You know, when I was uh, practicing law in Ohio, uh, one of the things I did was workers' compensation law. And I would defend large corporations against claims by, by employer, employees. Most of the claims were valid claims, but many of them were not valid. But the burden of proof was on the employee to prove the claim. I spoke with a uh, large owner of restaurants who told me that there was an employee who claimed $65,000 in, uh, in uh, failed wages uh, was owed to him. He found out that this person wasn't even in the state of California when the alleged uh, wages were incurred. Uh, and he was in uh, uh, litigation with uh, the lawyer for uh, some time. Uh, the lawyer then wanted to settle. He refused to settle. The lawyer wanted to settle. He refused to settle. It turns out the burden of proof is on the employer to disprove the claim. I think this is outrageous. Uh, and to the extent that I can reverse that, I will do so. That's one of the many thousands of, thousands of cuts uh, that make it more, more difficult for the middle class and working class people here in California and for employers who want to employ people to employ them. Uh, so the labor unions have a great deal of power uh, and I think that that power needs to be cut back. One of the things that I think has been monstrous has been AB5. AB5 is a legislature that's made independent contractors, many of them are disabled, uh, into full-time employers, uh, employees rather, and uh, many of them have therefore lost their jobs because you jacked up the price of hiring an independent contractor or someone that used to be an independent contractor. And a lot of people lost their jobs. Thousands of people as a result have lost their jobs. To the extent that I can reverse AB5, I intend to do that. So regardless of, of how you see sort of their stances, a lot of these groups like the realtors, the, uh, the trades, the affordable housing groups all play a massive role in the legislature. So I'm guess I'm wondering how exactly do you plan to work together to get something through because they have effective, they have been effective at killing um, multiple previous attempts to streamline housing as you're aiming to do. Well, again, I think it requires somebody to explain to, to the average Californian exactly uh, the power that these uh, labor unions and other special interest groups have. Uh, and why it is that uh, so many people are leaving, why it is that so many middle-class jobs are leaving. Uh, there's an article uh, in The Atlantic, uh, which is a left-wing publication called The California Dream is Dying. And they talk about the power of the public sector unions, the power of the labor unions, 
the power of the environmentalists, all of which conspire to make life for, far more difficult for people living in the, in the middle class and then the working class, and that is why we're having a net migration out of California. I don't think a lot of people have connected the dots between the very groups that you just now mentioned and why it is that people are having difficulty uh, hiring people, firing people, why it is we're having difficulty building homes. I think all of these special interest groups need to be taken on uh, and need to be taken on rhetorically, and that's what I intend to do. Another massive um, barrier to, to getting housing legislation through is also um, homeowner groups and local jurisdictions. Um, experts say that housing is a bit of a collective action pro problem. Everyone wants more of it, but no one really wants it in their city or their backyard. Um, do you believe that these decisions should be made at the state level? For example, zoning reform to allow more than one home on a single family lot? Um, and if so, how do you plan to appeal to these very powerful um, and very diverse opponents of local change? I think the best decisions, whether it's housing or anything else, uh, is better done at the local level. Uh, I would not be passing all sorts of state uh, laws and state mandates, uh, but I believe that things that, that, uh, like that should be done at the, at, the, at the local level, not at the state level. And so what many experts say has happened by letting these issues be uh, sorted at the local level is not a lot of progress. And as we're seeing this type of housing crisis. Um, so what do you believe the state should be doing besides reforming CEQA um, to, to ensure that the state actually meets its housing goals? You know, there, there are benefits and costs. Uh, and I think that often the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, costs are not explained clearly to Californians but I do believe that still these decisions should be done uh, at the local level. Uh, and uh, I believe that to the extent that you can readily file a lawsuit uh, because of CEQA, we should do something about that. We also should have truth in lawsuits so that we know exactly who's suing whom. I finding often uh, that a lawsuit is filed. Another group uh, gets a different name, files another lawsuit, and the same issue is litigated over and over and over again. We ought to do something about how long litigation takes. I'm not opposed to people uh, at the local level filing lawsuits because of projects that they're unhappy with, but at some point there should be an end point to this. Uh, and I'm finding uh, unending litigation uh, and therefore unending costs uh, in building homes. And then the very same uh, uh, community complains about the, uh, the, the lack of homes. Uh, there should be some balance here. Benefits and costs need to be appreciated and I'm not sure that they often are. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Manuela. Um, and now I'm going to turn to Ben Christopher, our political reporter. Hey, Mr. Alder. Thanks so much again for, for giving us all of your time. I know we all appreciate it. Um, I'm, if you don't mind, going to shift gears pretty dramatically. I was hoping to ask you a, a personal question, which is, uh -oh. I, <laughs> uh, so I know your mother was a Democrat and your father was a Republican. So I'm just curious, when was it and how was it that you decided how you identify politically? Well, my mother was a Kennedy Democrat, as in John F. Kennedy Democrat, who was a Cold War warrior. He was a World War II vet. He was a hunter. Uh, while uh, abortion was not an issue during the 1960 election, uh, his sister Eunice was a, is a staunch, was a staunch pro-lifer. Uh, there's every reason to believe that John Kennedy felt the same way. Uh, he was a hunter. He believed in the Second Amendment. He also was a tax cutter. He proposed uh, a much larger tax cut uh, by percentage than, say, George W. Bush did. Uh, I believe if John Kennedy were today with that uh, array of, uh, of positions, he would be a Republican. So my mother was not a tax, spin, regulate, soft on a national security kind of Democrat, which is the kind of Democrat today being dread by people, being uh, led by people uh, like the squad and like people like, uh, like Al Sharpton, who, by the way, uh, if you Google Al Sharpton and the name um, and, and the word uh, kingmaker, you'll find all sorts of hits. So my mother was not that kind of Democrat, I believe. And, and furthermore, my mother voted twice for George W. Bush. She never changed her party affiliation. I tried to get her to do that, but she wouldn't. So I came from a household where people believe in hard work, uh, in less government, uh, in lower taxes. And one of the things both my mom and my dad strongly agreed on uh, is, the, is their hostility to what they call the welfare state uh, or, or going on the county, as my parents used to call it. As you know, Lyndon Johnson launched the so-called War on Poverty in 1965. Uh, and uh, at that time, 25% of black children were into the world without a father married to the mother. Uh, that number now is almost 70%. So 25% of white kids now enter the world without a father married to the mother. Nearly half of all Hispanic kids do, and 40% of all American kids do. 
And with Barack Obama, who said a kid raised without a father is five times more likely to be poor and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up uh, in jail. I think we ought to be having a discussion about whether or not the uh, welfare state has encouraged women to marry the government and has encouraged men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. I think it has, and I think we ought to take a good hard look at that. Many of the things that we're talking about, inequality, for example, if it weren't for the inequality uh, going on uh, in, in terms of uh, kids entering the world without a father married to the mother, many of these problems, whether it's crime, uh, whether it's bad educational outcomes would be avoided. So I think we need to strengthen families uh, and that's where we need to start. Uh, Democrats are real good at dealing with the causes of, uh, with the symptoms rather of things that they cause. And I believe that the left has caused uh, an attack on the, on the nuclear family. We're having all sorts of unintended bad social consequences as a result. And so when was it that you took all of those, those values that were instilled within you by both your parents, it sounds like, and, well, I, and, and, I'm and translated it in, into, oh, I'm a Republican. When did you decide yeah, well, that? Well, there wasn't any, any, any one day, any one epiphany. I think it's a gradual kind of thing. I remember studying economics when I was in college, and I realized the damage done by, by the minimum wage, which is something that sounds like it's uh, uh, just fair and right and proper, uh, when in fact, it turns out it, it hurts jobs. Uh, for people who are unskilled, many of whom are, are black and brown people. And uh, uh, again, my father, um, I have uh, two brothers who served in the military during the Vietnam uh, era. Uh, my little brother was actually, actually went to Vietnam. My older brother was uh, in the Navy during the Vietnam era. He was on the, uh, in the Mediterranean in the Sixth Fleet. My father was a, a Marine. And so I've always had uh, pride in our, in our national defense, and I've always had very strong views about national security. So I don't think there was any one, on one moment. Uh, I was for a while registered as declined the state. And then when I decided to consider running for political office some years ago against Barbara Boxer, hmm. I registered as a Republican. Uh, and, but I've always voted, I haven't voted for a Democrat since 1976, and that was Jimmy Carter, and I regret that. Hmm. <laughs> And, and, and as a, a young black man growing up in, I think, Pico Union, is that right? Right. Well, I, for, right born in Pico Union until I was seven years old. Oh, okay. We moved to South Central. My dad okay. retained our home in, in Pico Union and uh, knocked it down and built up a little cafe, uh, which he ran until in his mid-80s. And I worked for him for a number of time. But, yeah, I moved to South Central. It was called South Central then. Now it's called South L.A. Uh, <laughs> back in uh, 1959. And so going from South Central and then going to Brown University, you're really going from a very democratic hotbed to a very liberal hotbed. And I just wonder, did you um, come into conflict? Was that, was that a, a, a constant source of debate with, the, with your peers? Actually, it wasn't. Then? Actually, it wasn't. When you look at the professors <clears throat> that we had uh, at, in that era, many of them were uh, military vets. Mm -hmm. uh, I studied a lot of political science. And I, and I had a professor named Lyman Kirkpatrick. Uh, who was involved in what became ultimately the CIA, and he was very uh, uh, pro-CIA. I had another professor named Whitney Tro Perkins, uh, who was also a World War II vet. Uh, and I think the whole quality professors in that era, even though the kids were very liberal, uh, was far more conservative than right now. Now the professors are very liberal, uh, and even more liberal sometimes than even the kids are. But in, when I was there, you had a lot of professors that um, that believed in national security, that were not uh, hostile to America. We didn't have socialists. We didn't have Marxists. I recall my professor from, uh, of economics, uh, she said that there ain't no such thing as a free lunch uh, and talked a lot about the trade-offs, uh, you know, zoning, zoning ordinances, uh, increase the cost of housing. Uh, she talked about the damage being done by the minimum wage. Uh, and so I don't believe the professors were nearly as radical uh, as they are right now. So I don't recall having any real uh, uh, issues with my professors. Um, okay. And um, I was young. I, I think I remember feeling at one point that we should have socialized medicine until I took mm -hmm. economics and realized that the, the best way of improving the quality of anything is competition. You want to increase accessibility, want to increase quality, uh, you want to lower the prices, you need to have competition, whether it's um, in healthcare or flat screen TVs. So to, to shift gears for a second, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your relationship with Stephen Miller, because I think a lot of people would be surprised to learn that he got his uh, his, his his career start perhaps on your on your program. Uh, I, I wonder why you bring up Stephen Miller. Uh, is there something about Stephen Miller that I should be defending or should be advocating? What, why would you bring him up? Because he's a well-known public figure. Uh, so and so is Thomas Sowell. Thomas Sowell has been on my show many times, as has Walter Williams been on my show many times. 
uh, as has Leo Hanian been on my show many times, as has Stephen Moore been on my show many times. Why would you bring up Stephen Miller? Well, isn't it true that he called in when he was in high school? I think it's a... it, it is true. He called in when he was in high school. He was, was on my show a number of times. But I, I just wonder what, what the point is of bringing up Stephen Miller. We're talking about crime. We're talking about the rising cost of, of uh, living in California. We're talking about homelessness. We're talking about the way Governor Gavin Newsom shut down the state by ignoring science. And you bring up Stephen Miller. I'm just wondering what the, what the agenda here is. What's the point? Am I, am I somehow uh, what? Uh, uh, what a, a Nazi, a fascist? I mean, what what is it? What's the point you're bringing? I, I don't say any of those sure. things. Well, then why don't you why don't you answer my question? What's the point in bringing up Stephen Miller when I've been on radio 27 years? I've had numerous people on my on my program, uh, including people like uh, uh, like um, uh, Joel Kotkin, who is a long time was a long time uh, liberal who voted for Jerry Brown. Uh, who's now done, if not a 180, certainly a 90 degree on how he used to feel about lots of things. Uh, you don't bring up Stephen Greenhut, uh, who's written a couple of books, uh, one of them called Plunder, which talks about the power of the public sector union. He also wrote one called Winning the Water Wars, about how we have not added to our water infrastructure in 40 years. All, all the people that I've had on my program, all the authors I've had on my program, you bring up Stephen Miller, and I want to know why. Like I said, just because he's a well-known persona, and I, he's a controversial person for a lot of folks. I just wanted to hear the story. But if you'd rather not talk about it. Well, uh, he came on my program uh, as a teenager. By mm -hmm. the way, Michelle Malkin uh, was on my radio show the first time she'd ever been on TV or radio. You don't mention her. Uh, the editor in chief of Breitbart. Uh, his, I got his first um, uh, conservative job was with me. Um, mm -hmm. There have been lots, lots of conservatives and lots of, um, of, of Republicans I've had on my program, but you, he's the only one that you that you mentioned and just seems Seems odd to me that you've done that. Okay. Well, I, I certainly didn't have an agenda. I just wanted to uh, learn more about that backstory. Mm -hmm. um, moving on then to another question. I know you've already been asked today, uh, at least twice, <laughs> as I saw, but just for folks who are watching this, I wanted to give you an opportunity to, uh, to respond to this uh, claim that Kevin Faulkner, the former uh, San Diego mayor, made about this article which he mentioned last night's debate, last night being Tuesday. Um, and I, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm mischaracterizing it, but my understanding of the article, this is from 2000, so this was 21 years ago, mm -hmm. was that the Democrats often win elections because they can make emotionally charged arguments that appeal to uh, voters who maybe don't have, knows much about politics or economics or, or some of the policy trade-offs that you've been talking about including a majority of women voters. And so I wonder, is that a fair characterization of the article? And, and do you care to, sure, to respond I'm to it? Sure, I'm happy to respond to it. Uh, first sure. of all, your characterization of the article is, is far more fair than his characterization, characterization of the article. Hmm. I don't think he even read it. I think someone told him that Larry wrote, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, women uh, are not as smart as, uh, as men. Women are uh, less informed as men, something to that effect. Uh, I, I'm assuming you read the article, otherwise you would not have interpreted it as fairly as you just now did. Uh, what I was doing was citing an Annenberg study that looked at, I think it was 25 issues, and it turned out men knew more than women did in 15 of those issues. Uh, the article also said that uh, women know more and care more about so-called she issues, social security, health care, and education. Men care less about those kinds of things. Men care more about taxes, about spending, and about uh, uh, national security than do women. I also quoted uh, a professor uh, at the Annenberg School. Her name is Jameson, if I'm not mistaken. If you look at her body of work, she certainly is left wing. And she acknowledged that women knew far less than men did about those 25 issues. And her conclusion was that women get their primary source of news from local news. And she said, and this is a quote, I'm paraphrasing, local news watching makes you stupid, close quote. I didn't say it, uh, Jameson did. And so the article was all about how Democrats assume that some people know less about certain issues. And when you know less about a given issue, no matter what it is, you're more, you're more capable of being manipulated. I didn't say women were less uh, intelligent than men. I didn't say they were dumber than men. I said women care more about social security, healthcare, and education than men. Men care more about taxes and, uh, and uh, national security than do women. And that was the, that was the article. Uh, of all the things that I thought would come up when I decided to run for office, and I sat very long and hard and figured out what kinds of things would come up, uh, that is not at all one that I thought would come up. And I think if you read the article fairly, uh, it is an even-handed article where, again, I'm quoting a left-wing uh, organization called the Annenberg School, which is at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm quoting a left-wing professor. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ben. Um, and and uh, I, I just wanted to follow up on one one part of Ben's um, questions. Uh, you've been described as a, a libertarian, and I wonder if you think that's appropriate. And if so, what does that mean in terms of how you see the role of government? Mm -hmm. Uh, I am a small L libertarian, <clears throat> excuse me, as was Milton Friedman. Uh, Milton Friedman was a small L libertarian and also a member of the Republican Party. I'm a small L libertarian and a member of the Republican Party. <clears throat> Most libertarians believe uh, that government is too big, taxes too much, and regulates too much. Um, things like the minimum wage. Um, I've talked about minimum wage only because somebody else brought it up. It's not one of my policy agenda items, but all of a sudden the reporter's hair was on fire. Um, I don't think you're going to find uh, very many libertarians who believe that there ought to be a minimum wage at all. Frankly, I don't think you're going to be, find very many economists who believe that the minimum wage uh, is a positive thing. Um, one of the things that I find amusing about this whole topic about the minimum wage when it's come up, it's come up several times, and it's been one of the things that Gavin Newsom has mentioned, and I think one of his hit pieces on me, is that when I've had this discussion, I've urged people to take a look at a editorial, not op-ed, an editorial in the New York Times, 1987, uh, the headline, The Ideal Minimum Wage, 0.00. .00. I also wrote a column uh, that people have not referred to, uh, in which I talked about, uh, I think the title is something like, when uh, Jonathan Gruber and Paul Krugman used to practice economics. Uh, Paul Krugman is probably the most famous economist in the country uh, because he writes a column for the New York Times and therefore has a great deal of influence. Not very many years ago, he wrote negatively about the impact of the minimum wage. He's since done a 180, but, he, but Economics 101 has not done a 180. And, uh, Paul, and uh, Jonathan Gruber, the uh, architect of Romney Care and one of the co-architects of, uh, of Obamacare, wrote as recently as 2011 about the negative effects of the minimum wage and furthermore wrote about the negative effects of a state mandated family and medical leave. Uh, Milton Friedman, the Nobel laureate referred to the, mil the minimum wage as, quote, perhaps the most anti-Negro law in the statute books, close quote. And also my friends, uh, Thomas Sowell uh, and the late Walter Williams have also written negatively about the minimum wage, both of whom happen to be black. So the hair on fire stuff uh, by reporters in reacting to when I was asked about the minimum wage suggests to me that reporters don't know anything about, uh, about economics, couldn't, couldn't tell the difference between Adam Smith and Adam 12. Uh, have never taken a, a course in economics 101 because this is just basic econ 101. You're hurting the very people that the left claims to care about. Unskilled people who now cannot bargain uh, for a job because you're, pre you're preventing them from, from demanding what they really are worth and many of them are not worth $15. I want to say one more thing about that, about the libertarian stance I have. Um, several people told me years ago when Los Angeles mayor was debating whether or not to sign the bill to increase the minimum wage to $12, it's now close to $15, if not $15. And he invited, get, uh, Eric Garcetti did, a number of small business people in to talk about this. I think 20 or 30 people were invited in and every one of them uh, brought in their profit and loss statements. I know this because I, was, uh, I received phone calls from several people who were at this meeting and they all said the same thing. They brought in their profit and loss statements and they told Garcetti about their thin profit margins. And if you jack up the price of, of labor, which is our number one cost, uh, we're going to either defer hours, uh, defer hiring decisions, cut hours, or jack up prices, all of which are going to have negative effects. And Eric Garcetti, who, by the way, went to the London School of Economics, didn't study economics, he studied ethnic studies, but you think by osmosis he might learn a little something about Econ 101. He stood up, buttoned his jacket, and said, well, I think you can absorb the cost, and walked out of the room. This is somebody who's never even uh, run a hot dog stand, telling people working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, I can ar ar arbitrarily increase your cost of, of, uh, of, of um of business uh, and it won't have any negative consequences. This is the kind of insulting thing uh, that I think most libertarians have a real problem with and this one does as well. Mm -hmm. That is all the time that we have. Um, thank you very much all of you for, for your questions and for taking the time to do this. Thank you also for your flexibility once again. Um, Larry, do you have any final comments? Yeah, yeah, don't, don't hurt me. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I, I, I'm, a na I'm a rational, common sense kind of, kind of person. I don't have horns. I don't have a tail. We all, I assume, want the same things. And that is for people to realize their God-given potential. We may have different uh, routes of doing that, different policies for, for doing that. But we all want the same thing. And the way that I'm treated by the left-wing media sometimes is almost amusing to me. You've never heard these arguments before. You've never heard the argument that there are trade-offs. You've never heard the argument uh, that government uh, should get out of the way and let the individuals make their own decisions. Uh, and I make these kind of, in my opinion, very commonsensical arguments. Um, a lot of the media go, go absolutely, absolutely ballistic. And that's because I think people have, have, uh, have had to, to, I've had to deal with the filter of, pe of people like the LA Times uh, and, uh, and they've been absolutely hostile. I'm born and raised here in California. I'm from the hood. Uh, it seems to me that uh, I ought to be a success story. May I just say this real, real quickly? Uh, I have published about a half a dozen books at least two of them have been on the New York Times bestseller list. At least two of them have been on the LA Times bestseller list. The LA Times has never once reviewed any of my books. I did a documentary that came out Juneteenth last year uh, called Uncle Tom, an oral history of the black conservative. If you haven't seen it, I, I urge you all to take a look at it. Uh, and uh, it made more money than all five of the, uh, of the films that were nominated for best documentary last go round, made more money combined, had a higher IMDB rating than any of the ones that was nominated. Uh, and I, we hired a consultant to get the, the movie considered for Academy Award consideration. Uh, and it made their short list of 250 documentaries, but did not make the list of the, of the five. The one that won had something to do with uh, my, uh, my relationship with an octopus. I haven't seen it. I heard it's very good. I'm not saying it's not very good, but I just find it just surprising that um, I've been shut out like this. And this is why so many people uh, have, this, have this reaction to me until I open my mouth and they realize uh, that, I, that I'm not some sort of, um, of uh, a radical person that's going to undermine their rights, uh, that's going to club baby seals uh, and eat their heads. Uh, I'm a commonsensical kind of guy who's got commonsensical, commonsensical points of view, born and raised in this state, and I want to see people realize their potential. So that's kind of my last soapbox uh, argument, and um, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for your time. To learn more about the recalled election and more on candidates' views, check out our recall voter guide on calmatters.org.